Hi, thanks for coming. <laughs> Last night around uh, 9 o'clock and right up until midnight, the number one tweet in the world was the Central Park Five tweet, <laughs> hashtag CP5. And if you're out there on the web tonight watching this show, please feel free to tweet your questions or your comments. We'll be looking forward to reading them later on. And we'll also be taking questions this evening from the audience here at the Time Center in New York. About 10 years ago or so, a college student came to visit me at the Times, the old Times building, not here. And she was writing a paper about violence and women and media coverage and race. And she had some ideas about turning it into a book. And I was just thrilled, because she was concentrating on the Central Park jogger case, which I had just spent a heck of a lot of time writing about with my colleague Kevin Flynn here at the Times. And so we sat up in the Times lunchroom for two hours or so talking about this. And at the end of it, I said, what are you going to do after this? And she said, oh, I think I'm going to make a documentary about it. And I, I thought, but did not say, little girl, are you <laughs> out of your mind? <laughs> and uh, but I said, you know, it's a lot of money, a lot of time. The guys are hard to get. It's, oh my god, it's so much work. And she said, well, my, my dad's going to give me a hand. I said, who's your dad? <laughs> <laughs> So Ken Burns is her dad. <laughs> Sarah Burns is the author of the book. David McMahon, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, but David McMahon is the third maker of this film. He uh, is also the husband of Sarah. And uh, they have created a piece of uh, journalism and documentary film that I think uh, has provoked tremendous uh, contemplation by people in New York and now around the world about what justice is. But it also tells us about the city that existed in 1989. And it's much different than the city we're all sitting in tonight. And to start off tonight's program, I'd like to look at one of the clips from the film that sets the scene in 1989. New York in the late 1980s was a completely schizophrenic, divided city. There was enormous wealth gushing into the city out of the rise of the financial industries, which had surged beginning around 1980. So the city that had been in a big collapse for several decades had turned around. But there was a whole side to the city in which drug gangsters and crack and a kind of hard, permanently locked underclass was in place, and there was enormous suffering. It was as if there was a social moat that divided these two New Yorks. The city, when I came in, uh, was on the edge of uh, bankruptcy, and people thought we would not uh, recover. We were a city coming out of a series of crises, enormous economic crisis, a school system that was in collapse, political institutions that seemed to be failing the people and not meeting their needs, old, fashionable, beautiful, noble neighborhoods falling apart. And of course, overriding was crime. Several things happened to me that I just considered normal part of living in New York City couple of muggings and near muggings, and I didn't even report any of these things. Just kind of figured it's the way it is. People had it worked out in their heads 
that their block was safe. The streets they walked to get to the subway to go to work, they were okay. Their subway line, they got on the same spot in the train every day. That was okay. They had figured out a safe path through this, uh, you know, garden of terrors. And then in about 84, crack came to New York City, and that increased crime. No question uh, about it. When the crack wars happen, all of a sudden, teenagers have lots of cash and guns. And all hell breaks loose in Bedford-Stuyvesant. All hell breaks loose in Harlem. All hell breaks loose in Brownsville, East New York. We were supposed to be afraid. It would have been irrational not to be afraid. But the people who suffered most with the rise of criminality, gang wars, drug wars, were actually the people we blamed. Most of the homicides were young, poor, working class, black and brown kids. And the dominant social message was, no one cared if you lived or died. As far as I'm concerned, in the late 80s, in New York City, the black community was under assault. The most endangered species in America, that was a popular phrase, was the young black man. April 19th, 1989. Yusuf Salam. What happened that night? Where were you? Well, April 19th, 1989 was a, um, a turning point of, uh, of life, so to speak. You know, you go from um, hanging out with friends, thinking that you're going to, you know, go skateboarding in the park or walk around the lake, you know, to mayhem, so to speak, breaking out, you know, and you kind of looking at it from the perspective of, wow, this is, this is crazy. What's going on here? You know? Yeah. Kevin, do you remember that night? Ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh... How did it begin for you? What, where were you? Uh, <clears throat> people remember that Wednesday night, it was um, Easter vacation. So, um, Kids, we could hang out a little later because there was no school to Monday. And um, at that time, I was quite good in basketball, so um, I was playing basketball outside, basically in Schaumburg, where I lived at. And went from, like Yusuf was explaining, went from one moment uh, playing basketball, and then the next moment, everything became a blur, and got to a point that I was living in a nightmare, but I was still awake. Well, before it gets to a blur, you, you left the basketball court. Why? Who, did, who, who said, let's do something else? Or did you say, let's do something else? What, what, what got you going? You know, I lived across the street um, from the park, actually, on 110th in Manhattan, up in Manhattan. And I seen a, a group of kids entering the park. At the time, I followed. Mm -hmm. Did you know these guys? I knew some from just seeing them in the neighborhood. And I knew some from school. But that night, I, um, I was a follower. I followed them into the park. Raymond, <clears throat> what happened in the park? Well, you know, <clears throat> when you go into the park and you're going with a group of kids, and there's older guys, there's bigger guys, and, and you know, uh, as you walk in, police, you know, run up on us because they see a large group of kids and a lot of kids scatter. And we spent that we spent a lot of time looking for other people. That I, you know, like for me, I came in with with a group uh, with a couple of friends that went to school with me, and I lost them. Uh -huh. So so that was really spent a lot of that time was spent looking for them in the park. Yeah. Corey, do you remember how you ended up in the park that night? Coming out of 
Kennedy fried chicken. After all these years, 20, 23 years, 24 years, it's still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, had a lady friend with me. And uh, as we was on our way out, about to head upstairs, where she resided, uh, Yusuf, Yusuf came my way and asked me about uh, what was about um, hanging out with her. And uh, that was it. Antron, do you remember um, violence in the park that night? Can you tell me about that? Oh, yes, I remember violence. Um, it was it was just real hectic. It was crazy. Um, just standing there and watching somebody get beat. You know, um, it was just I, I, just, I couldn't believe it. But I stayed there. You know, to watch a man. You know, watch a man get beat. Um, yeah. I stayed there, but it was unreal. I think I think one of the unfortunate realities of um, being a child. You know, is there, there's a certain amount of curiosity when you see things. It's almost like moths being drawn to fire, you know. And it's interesting, like, you know, when, when uh, Kevin says that it was, you know, we live right across the street, essentially we all thought, we who lived in Schaumburg looked at Central Park as our backyard. You know, it, was, it wasn't a crime for us to ever have gone into the park. It was like, you know, a natural thing. You know, many of us were just experiencing um, trying to be romantic, you know. <laughs> So for us, a romantic day would be walking around the mirror. And it's funny, because back then, you think about that, and it wasn't a, a, a pleasant-looking mirror at the time. You know, it's, it was smelly and all of that stuff, but it was our mirror, you know. And you know, when, when Antron is talking about this idea of seeing violence breaking out, I think that that's another um, reality that you face as a child, just kind of looking at something and saying, oh, wow, what, what is this? Like, this is, this is absolutely crazy. You know, um, a lot of people, they, they sometimes don't understand it from that perspective and realize that, in realizing rather, that a child can be a witness to something without being a participant in something. And then all of a sudden now, here we became known as the culprits, you know. Right. And that was the part that was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what drew you to this story? Well, I, in 1989, when this happened, I was six years old. And so it wasn't a story that I'd followed in the news at all at that time. Um, and I learned about it first in 2003. I was a college student, and I spent the summer working for a civil rights lawyer. I was thinking about going to law school. And uh, this lawyer was just then getting involved in the civil suit that is still now ongoing 10 years later in this case. And I, that was how I learned about the case. And I was so shocked. I think I don't think I'd really been exposed to a story quite like this before, at least not in a contemporary setting as this. And I started looking at the media coverage and seeing this language that was used, wilding and wolf pack, and it sort of fit with what I was studying and it reminded me of these things I'd learned about in African American history classes about the Scottsboro Boys case. Um, and I was just so sort of shocked to see that it had happened in 1989, this kind of language being used to describe a group of teenagers. And that was sort of the beginning for me. And I wrote about that as an undergraduate. But there was so much more to the story. And that's when I started talking to you and trying to learn how something like this happens. If, if that time in 10 years ago, uh, Ken Burns had come to me in the lunchroom at the Times and started asking me questions about the Central Park jogger case, I'd say, whoa, man, this is a really complicated, intense story. And he'd say, well, yeah, but Sarah Burns is my daughter. And she <laughs> so Ken, uh, your films have uh, covered all aspects of American life going back uh, and to our earliest days as a country. And this one is your most contemporary project. Why did you take it on? Well, I, I think the preface to it is that Sarah has, as long as I've known her, which is as long as anyone has known her, <laughs> um, has had this 
fierce sense of fairness. And there's something elemental about this story that you get at that all of the five men here get at in the film and that we hope that we could sort of be the amanuensis for, which is that complexity that you were talking mm -hmm. about. This is seemingly contemporary, but as Sarah suggests, it's as old as the United States of America. It's as old as 1619 when the first um, slaves arrived in this country. Whenever you are pursuing as vigorously as we all have over the last 35, 40 years, American history, you inevitably come up, of, up against the same themes and questions that engage this one of not just race, but class, of justice, of freedom, of um, popular culture, and all of these things. Uh, you know, this is a complex story, but you know, the Civil War is pretty complex too. Well, and yeah, I get you. the narratives of baseball are complex and jazz as well, but all of them inevitably, you know, remind us back to that original thing that we yeah. tend to judge people by the co color of their skin and not the content of their character. And I think what this film tries to do is, is in some ways try to re reboot or rebalance that with an emphasis on content of character. And as you know, the five men up here show throughout the film and, and at this moment, you know, character is what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's also about telling stories, though. And in our next clip, we're going to see how this story first came to the public and came to uh, people around the world, really. And uh, it, it was something almost out of uh, the worst of the fairy tales, mm. the, the most nightmarish stories that we tell ourselves to frighten ourselves. And uh, I think this next clip will give us a good taste of that. And we'll, we'll see how all of the media in New York City jumped on to this thing. So, if we can get that clip rolling. In New York City this morning, a jogger is fighting for her life after a brutal attack in Central Park. Viciously battered and unconscious, wearing only a jogging bra, her hands tied over her mouth. The suspects are 14 and 15 year olds who blazed a nighttime trail of terror. Assaulting an elderly man, attacking a male runner, hitting another person with a lead pipe, at one time, the group was running in a pack of more than 25 youths. The victim is now in critical condition at Metropolitan Hospital. Two skull fractures, a significant loss of blood, and advanced hypothermia. If she lives, it's likely she'll suffer from brain damage. Eight suspects were arraigned this weekend, aged 14 to 17. Some of the young men told police they were just out wilding. Wilding is a word you won't find in Webster's. Wilding. New York City police say that's new teenage slang for rampaging and wolf packs, attacking people just for the fun of it. The district attorney's office says that the teenagers have confessed. The spokesman said some of those confessions are on videotape. A woman jogging and Central Park. Central Park was holy. If it had happened any place else other than Central Park, it would have been terrible but it would not have been as terrible. It was for everybody, not just me, the crime of the century. Kevin, what is wilding? Wilding is not a term. Uh, they actually came up with that term when we was in um, the precinct. I don't know who came up with it, but uh, that's not a term that we as kids use. They took that term and just ran with it. Uh, it doesn't make sense, actually. It's ridiculous that they even took that and made it so famous that people actually thought it was a word. Right. Which is not, folks. <laughs> well. Uh, one of the stories that I read at the time said that uh, the, the kids who were in the cells were singing uh, Do the Wild Thing. Does anybody remember any songs being sung back there? In That's Freedom? totally false. Totally false. <laughs> yeah. Tone Loke is a West Coast rapper. We wouldn't sing that back there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
there. But, but Sarah, Sarah, you know, I think there's there's one, I think a maybe more likely version. I mean, the, the word really came from the police who said in the press conference, this is what these kids were saying. But there's a sort of disconnect there. There's some, some kind of mistranslation or something happening because I don't think anyone was actually saying it. It may have been sort of a misinterpretation of Wylan, like Wylan out, which was a much, which had no uh, violent connotations. It's something you might say about just hanging out, sort of messing around. And so it's possible that someone heard that, but it's really, it's sort of a, a mystery. And it is um, amazing that it did, as Kevin said, become this label that stuck. I mean, it still sticks to this day. I think you, um, you know, people don't know what happened in this case. And you walk down the street and you'd say, oh, you know, we're making this film about the Central Park jogger rape and teenage, oh yeah, that wilding case. I remember that. Right. I mean, that's how people, that's the, what they associate with but, the story. But now, now, you know, anywhere, two people of color, men, together, commit a crime that's wilding. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't apply to the white mob in, in Howard Beach or Bensonhurst, uh, they weren't called wilders, uh, that resulted in the death of a human being of color. Um, so it, it becomes the same, you know, archetypal thing. As you, as you suggest, this just, it was so out, outrageous. And as we now know, it was outrageous, right. but, and incredible in the real sense of that word. But we went with it because it, it appealed to all the archetypal terrors of, of the vulnerable, white woman and the black mob, and this is birth of a nation and gone with the wind, you know, in, in a progressive northern city at the end of the 20th century. So what we had was a, a fictional concept, a fictional wor word about real events. There were people beaten up on the reservoir very badly. There were homeless people who had their food taken from them and beer poured on their heads. There were bicyclists who had rocks thrown at them. And there was, most tragically, a 28-year-old woman who was found late that night in a ditch, almost dead. Most of the blood in her body had left her. And the police had already grabbed groups of kids who were in the park that night. And upon hearing later on that this woman was near death, with no identification on her, they decided, well, these guys were in the neighborhood. Let's see. And so another story emerged, the story told in the confessions, what are called confessions, the interrogations. And over the last 24 years, we've learned a lot through the DNA era about the almost unthinkable possibility that people will say they did something that they actually didn't do, a terrible thing that they didn't do. And we wouldn't really have ever believed it. And in fact, we probably would never have believed that it was possible in this case uh, were it not for the emergence of DNA to, uh, and, and a quite coherent narrative from the real perpetrator. So the, the next tape we're going to look at uh, concerns those interrogations and the next clip that we're going to look at. And um, I think it's uh, one of the most fascinating elements of this. Not necessarily for you guys so <laughs> fascinating, but for people stepping who are away from it, how could they say something? They did something if they didn't do it. So if we can uh, cue up that clip, we'll, we'll have a look at the, the description of how the interrogations took place and how this story came out. Hardigan sat down and he said, look, Ray, I know you didn't do anything wrong, but the other guys right now, they're in other precincts, and they're saying that you did it. And they're telling me, well, you're not saying nothing, but these guys put your name in it. 
And I'm like, I didn't do anything. And he's like, well, this is why I'm here to help you, because I know you didn't do anything. You were a good kid. You know, this isn't you. He pulls out this picture of Kevin Richardson, and he goes, you know this kid? And I'm like, no, I don't know him. And he goes, you see the scratch under his eye? That came from the woman. We know he did it. He's going down. At this point, I'm like, you know, like I don't know these, these guys that's, that's there, so I'm just going to make up something and, and include these guys' names. OK. If, if, you know, if you're going to do it to me, then I'm going to do it to you. We're looking at the people telling what happened, men in their mid-30s. But they're talking about different people altogether, aren't you? How old were you, Raymond? I was 14 years old then. Kevin, you? 14. Yeah. Uh, Antron, how old were you that night? 15. 15. And Yusef, you were 16? 15. 15. Corey, you were the elder statesman. Sure. How old were you? 16. But you were the, almost in a way, the youngest looking of the whole group. <laughs> but the handsomest. No, I meant, I, meant, I meant at the time, you were a little, you were, you were kind of a squirt. <laughs> Not the fearsome character you are today. <laughs> um, what was it like, Corey, for you to uh, be in that interrogation? First of all, let me ask you, uh, when folks, I, I hope you've seen the movie, and if you haven't, you'll, you'll get a chance <coughs> to see the actual <coughs> videotapes of the statements that the five um, gentlemen here made. Corey, you discuss a little bit in the film that you had had a hearing problem since you were quite young. Yes. And when you were being uh, interrogated and in interviewed that night, did, do you recall how your hearing and your understanding of what was being said to you, how did you, how did you process that? I mean, did you really get what was going on? Hell no. <laughs> no. no. What, what did you think they were, what were you trying to do when you spoke with them? I really didn't know what. I, my mind just felt like scrambled eggs. I really didn't know what was going on. I just wanted to get the hell home. Yeah. And uh, that was about it. There's a, a moment in your videotape, or maybe it's in the written statements, I don't remember, um, where, you, where you describe the group attacking a police van. Uh, and we know that didn't happen. Do you, do you remember even saying that? No. Well, it's, believe me, it's in the, it's in the paperwork. Oh, yeah. So there's, uh, there's many versions of the evening's mm. stories that you told that night. They, they had you. <clears throat> uh, on tape quite a bit. Mm. And uh, uh, Sarah, do you remember Corey's uh, multiple statements? <clears throat> yes, there were two. Corey gave two different, signed two different written statements and gave two different videotape statements. And each time, um, they didn't make sense because the information was wrong. And the police would sort of go back and help him get the right story. Mm and or the, the, the version of the story that they wanted to hear and would try it again. And so they kept sort of going back, hoping that this one would be the one that would be actually helpful to them um, in the case. And ultimately, they, you know, all of these were presented at trial. And Corey, though he served the longest sentence and received, received the longest sentence because of his age, was actually ultimately convicted of lesser crimes in large part because the jury saw these four wildly different statements and recognized that at least something was wrong, though they didn't have the guts to recognize that it was the whole thing was wrong. You know, the word that comes out all the time it, it, as in their retelling of, of these period, you know, that upwards of 30 hours with these seasoned detectives doing good cop, bad cop things, Yusef is confident that they're so angry that they're going to take him to the back and kill them, is that they just want to go home. And after no lawyers and no food and no parents for most of the, uh, you know, going home became a real objective to just end the nightmare. And all of the cops were giving them what they thought was this out, where if you just say it's another person, we'll let you go home. But of course, by saying it was another person, it made you present and implicated you in the crime. And so the, 
it, it, it's just one of the, as you watch it, I, I've watched this hundreds of times and you just develop this pit in your stomach because if anybody out there still says, well, I would have never done this, I think as you sit with them, you're absolutely confident how, comp how it could happen. And then you also have to say, they're 14, 15, and 16 years old. And never been in trouble before, hadn't been in the system, hadn't hadn't known how to, as many of the other boys who were responsible for some of the misdemeanors and, and felonies that you described in other parts of the park, had had the experience and knew how to not make statements, knew how to ask for a lawyer. And these guys were unfortunately the most vulnerable because they were the most innocent. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind our audience uh, here and also on the web that uh, we have uh, two hashtags going for this conversation, hashtag Central Park 5 and hashtag uh, Times Talks. So you're welcome to sending questions or comments as our conversation goes on. Antron, you knew that you had not participated in an attack on the woman. Did you know the other fellas who were accused of that well enough to be confident that they hadn't done it either? Or did it occur to you, well, maybe something, maybe they did something with that woman and I, I just didn't see it. Did that ever cross your mind? Well, um, in 1989, um, when I was in the room, I didn't, know, I didn't know what was going on. I just know I didn't have to do anything. Um, the group was large. I knew the group was large, so I didn't know who was capable of doing anything like that. So at the time, I was just like, I know I didn't have nothing to do with it, but I was getting blamed for it. Yeah. So I didn't know these guys. I didn't even go by the name of Antron. That's how I know they didn't know me. Um, I had a nickname. My name was Tron. Uh -huh. and anybody who knew me knew me as Tron. That's how I know when it's like, well, Kevin said Antron did it. I'm like, who's Kevin? I don't even know Kevin. Kevin don't know me. You know, I didn't even go by Antron. Yeah. So I didn't know. I didn't know who did it. Um. I just know I didn't do it, so I was just trying to get everybody back. I was just blaming whoever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that's how it went. That's, that's how it went for me. Raymond, did you think it was possible that a group had attacked the jogger? I mean, I never seen that, so I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't know these guys, you know. Um, and so when Kevin, when they, when he produced, when when Detective Harder can produce the picture of Kevin, it was just about me getting out of there. Yeah. You know, and, and also you know, my scene, the way my scene was set up, you know, um, Hardigan came in at, at the, the most critical time for me. And I felt like he saved me. And so I felt like, you know, I had to help him. Help him. You know, and Why so. Why do you think it was the most critical time? Because I, it, was, it, was, it was during a period where Arroyo was starting to lunge at me, like he was going to physically harm me. He was me. another detective. He was another detective. He was the lead investigator in my case. Uh -huh. And so he was, um, it was a point where you know he became fed up and he slammed his fist on the table and he, you're gonna give me what I want and he, and, he, and he lunged at me and right there is when Hardigan jumped in and stopped him. Right. And I felt like I was grateful like this man just saved my life. And then he kicked everybody out the room and then you know he started to work his magic, which was Raymond, you're a good kid and I know that you didn't do this, but I need your help. Right. You know, and he's like, Well, do you know Kevin Richardson? I said, No, I don't, never seen him before. Right. You know, and he says, Well, you know, we know he did it. He got the scratch on his face. Yeah. And that's how it starts to formulate. And then from there, he just fed me what he thought was the facts. Yusuf, this story has emerged of uh, multiple crimes in the park with the most horrible event being the attack on this woman. And it's all tied together by these statements. And the press and the media, worldwide media has taken up this horrible event and is screaming and yelling about it, and Donald Trump has taken out full-page ads calling for the return of the death penalty. Patrick Buchanan suggests that the eldest of the group, and we're sorry about this, Corey, no offense, but that the eldest should be taken out and, 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 and executed in Central Park, as an example. But you are not living in that world, you were living in a bubble of family and friends who were confident in your innocence. Absolutely. What was your sense, though, of this outer space, the asteroids that were 
wow. bouncing off your atmosphere? You know, this was the most dangerous time for young people at the time, you know. I always would hear about these things. You know, as adults, you think about this thing, about the statistics that they have, you know, that you're going to be dead or in jail before you reach the age of 21. And I always wondered where that statistic came from, you know. And then here you have this case of which we knew that we didn't have any involvement in this. We knew we didn't even have any involvement in any of the, um, the other crimes that happened in the park. But yet, as Antron said, we were all being blamed for this whole thing. And to be labeled and to be known as one of the Central Park Five was to be um, I don't want to just say targeted because targeted is, a, is, a, is like such a, it's an easy word. You know, a target isn't just, okay, I put a target on you and now you target. You know, that's not, it was like they were people taking shots at us. They were people that wanted us dead. Right. They were people that, that I mean, it became so uh, dangerous that my mother, who's sitting in the audience, um, decided to um, send me away for some time you know, put me in a different um, outfit. I'm saying outfit, but you know, it was, she, she camouflaged me, you know, just so that it could be all right for me to walk around. Uh -huh. You know, I had a fake wig on and some glasses and stuff. Really? You know, but it was because of that. It was because when, you, when any one of us came home, I mean, Raymond never came home on, provo on, on, um, bail. on bail, but Kevin knows what it was like, Antron knows what it was like, you know, it was not a popular thing in, in the sense of you being a rock star, being chased down right. you know, with the cameras running and so forth and so on. It was the most dangerous thing ever. Did you feel under assault? Were you <coughs> conscious? I mean, you're a kid, right? You're 14. Who cares what the newspapers are saying, right? <laughs> Who cares what the news is saying? Or do you? At the time, we cared because we felt at the time that the whole world was against us, I was scared to death. I had, when I was out on bail, I couldn't go to school. I had to drop out. I had my sisters had to escort me to the store. Mm. I'm 14. I couldn't live the life of an average kid. I missed my prom already. And I can remember going to school and I remember somebody saying, that's Kevin, that's the rapist. As, a, as 14, you don't really grasp what that means. We were sex offenders. You know, it's, it's still hard to this day to even to see that. And I, I didn't know what was going on. Right. I just wanted to be over, right. actually. And I remember thinking that it was just a nightmare every single day. Well, the, the next clip we're going to take a look at is about an escape route that you guys could have had at the time. And an offer came up that would have possibly gotten you all out of this nightmare, or maybe not. So if we could have a look at the uh, clip called Copping Out, we will see that discussion. It got to one point where they pulled me use of an Antron in the conference room. And the lawyer says, uh, you know, we're going to lose this case. What we're planning to do is see if we can get you a plea deal. And I remember telling them, you know, you guys can cop out. But if I did something, I would cop out. I would want the least amount of time for what I did. But if I didn't do anything, you can give me the rest of my life in prison, you know. I didn't know what that meant back then, but I just knew that there would be no way that I would cop out for something that I didn't do. They said, well, it has to be all three of you guys or it's nobody. And um, so we, you know, we, you know, we looked at each other. We was like, well, guess there's nobody. Hmm. Kevin, you were tried, you and Corey were tried separately. I don't recall if they made that plea offer to you, did they? Or did yes, you they did. They did. Yeah. 
and you obviously turned it down. Yes. Corey, you and Kevin both separately were in prison and went to a parole board. And they asked you about the events in the park that night. And you said you didn't have anything to do with attacking the woman. But when you go before parole, you have to show remorse. remorse. Where was your remorse? Mm -hmm. You didn't have remorse. None of you had remorse. Mm -hmm. None of you said to the parole board that you were sorry for what happened, even though that would have gotten you home earlier. Did it ever cross your mind, Corey, to, to, to say, let me get out of here. I've had enough of this life inside? No, my, uh, Wendy, Wendy Correctional Facility. And uh, about to do my, my parole hearings. I had, uh, I had, uh, I had a sit down with my, uh, with my counselor. I can't remember her name. She's a white woman. And uh, she says, Corey, you, you about to have come up to your parole board soon. I said, OK. And you know what they're going to ask you. I said, OK, are you remorseful, what have you? But uh, before you go there, I would, I would strongly suggest for you to do the sex offender, sex offender classes so they can see that you're trying to do something with that. So I said, but even if I didn't do anything, I don't know what the hell to do in there. I'd just be, just be, I'd just be looking like a clown in the room without, without participating. She said, well, all you can do is just try. But uh, I did the, did the program, and uh, there was a lot of uh, older peers in there that was already familiar with me. And uh, they were saying, Wise, Wise man, what you doing up in here? You ain't supposed to be up in here. Well, tell her that. <laughs> but uh, I said, um, but, shortly yeah. after, but shortly after that, I went, to my, I went to my first parole hearing. And, uh, They looked at my folder. Okay, so you uh, you want to such a poor guys? I said, okay, whatever the hell that means, but my name is Corey, Corey Wise. So they said, okay, uh, are you remorseful? About what? Look, they looked at each other. Well, for the crime. I said, I ain't do anything. Oh, okay. You want to know? Hmm. Whatever that meant, it's all right. So they just said, uh, Mr. Wise, long story short, you doing the 5 to 15? I said, I am. He said, uh, no matter whether you come down or not, we kind of wish we had a whole lot more time to do, maybe 57 years to do. Don't even bother coming down here, because as long as you come down here, we're going to hit you with two years. Mm. I said, wow. So I had to swallow that and went out. And uh, they never saw me again. Uh, I, had went to, I had went to Chow, break to dinner. Uh, I had came across, uh, as I was eating my dinner, I had came across a metal, a metal something metal in my, mm in my food, but I, I had, it was already caught in my throat. So uh, I went to medical, did the medical thing, and, uh, and a lot of my older peers, they were saying, wise, you've been up here long enough, 10 years. Try to use that to get the fuck out of here. Get on back down in the city. So I said, how can I do that? Something just happened with you, that's why they, they brought you back from child? I said, yeah, file a lawsuit. That showed the man on getting back down to New York. They're trying to keep you up here. So I did that. And that's where they brought me to Auburn. Uh -huh. wow. mm. Auburn is, uh, I guess, is about <coughs> as far from New York as you can get, uh, from New York City as you can get in New York State. Um, 
they were sending you the opposite direction of New York City. Well, all of these men come home except for Corey, whose, whose term goes on and on and on because he was tried as an adult. But the other folks come home. And then in 2002, a prisoner, a, a serial sex offender and killer named Matthias Reyes, notifies a corrections counselor that he's the person who actually committed the rape in Central Park, did the beating and near killing of that woman, and he says that he did it by himself. And that story is very well told in the film. Uh, I have to say that David McMahon and Sarah Burns and Ken Burns did a terrific job of tracing the path of the unraveling. But we're not here just to rehash the movie. We're here to rehash your lives. We're, we're here to actually see uh, where life has brought you. And, and there's a beautiful clip towards the end of the film that I'd like to bring up. And then we're going to talk just a, a couple minutes about that. And, uh, after that, we're going to go to some questions. So uh, if you're interested in putting some questions to any of the members of the panel, uh, start thinking about them, and we'll, we'll let you know there will be microphones around. So if we could bring up that uh, clip that's entitled Reflections. I'm always behind. Those years that it took for me, I lost a lot. And even now, at the age of 36, where I should be fully in a career, have a house, a car, maybe marry, I don't have any of that. And so I don't know how to regain that stuff anymore. So I'm just here. I lost my youth. I lost seven years of my life. I lost that sense of, of being youthful and missing the average things of going to school and going to the prom. Just, just living like an average 14, 15 year old kid. You can forget, but you won't forget. You won't forget what you done lost. No money could bring that time back. No money could bring the life that was missing with the time that was taken away bring back. Nothing. It hasn't become easier to live as an adult. It's become harder. It's always more difficult to do something if you have this huge gap of your life taken away from you. And it's not like just because they said, OK, we are vacating the convictions, that that vacated the whole prison term. That whole prison term happened. It was a reality. We really went through that. Still struggle every day. But I made it. You know, came home, didn't get in trouble. Worked ever since I came home. Pay taxes. Take care of my kids. Doing the best I can, so I told him I was gonna make it. I told him. The truth came out. The truth came out. Antron, mm -hmm. you didn't participate in the film and to the extent of allowing your modern, handsome self to be filmed and photographed. We got to look at you as a, a young teenager. What happened after you came home? Um, couldn't find a job. I had some relatives in Maryland. Um, they told me, come out, come on, come on out, um, look for a job. And I was like, look for a job, nobody's gonna hire me. And my cousin, just give it a try. 
you know. So I went out there, first day job hunting, and I got hired on the spot, sanitation job. But um, I think the thing that helped me was my name. Um, all these years I've been going by Antron McCray from 89 to like, so I came home in 96. But I didn't realize my, my name is Antron Brown. <coughs> That's my name. It always been my name. My mother got married, but um, she never changed. I never got my name changed. So I always been, I went through the system as Antron McCray, went through school as Antron McCray, but that kind of helped me out. When they did background checks, my name didn't pop up. So it helped me out and I just ran with it. I mean, job hopping here and there, just getting jobs. Whoever paid a dollar more, I go mm -hmm. <laughs> get an extra dollar. But um, I just had to get away. Um, I couldn't deal with it. Actually, Raymond's my therapist. I speak <laughs> <laughs> All these guys, I mean, I speak to Kevin. Um, they deal, they, they deal, with it, deal with it totally different. You know, um, I can't handle it. I mean, I added some weight on, changed my name. I mean, my, you know, got my original name, added some weight, like 150 more pounds. Left the city. And I, you know, I really look up to these guys. I'm like one of the oldest, you no know, Corey than me, but I look up to them because I'm so bitter. I got so much anger in me, you know? Um, and I'm not, the type, I'm not the type of person to turn the cheek. I mean, we lost our lives. We grew up in a system, you know? We grew up in a system. And the thing about it, my mother, I'm the only child. So when I left, that was it. You know, it, it hurts. And um, to this day, I give her, like, I give, I give my mother so much credit. Because I, I always looked up to my father, you know, but um, he left us, but then he came back. But the reason why he came back, because he is sick, you know? If you look at the movie, it's just me and my mother. You know, and she's, what, 4'11"? You know, um, we just getting threatened every day. We, we on the train. My, paper, my face is in the paper. I'm very bitter. That's why I don't come out all too often. But um, I mean, it's just hard for me to deal with, but I thank these guys, because they, they deal with it better than me. You know, um, I just want to get away, but you know, the city's dragging their feet. But it's funny, because 1989, we had a trial. We went to trial so quick. You know, you know, we started doing our sentence like in a matter of what, a year? A year and a half. You know, we look 10 years, 11 years, we still fighting. Mm. We still fighting. It hurts me, man, because I didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. But then you, got, you still have some people thinking we got all kinds of technicality. It's not like that. We didn't do it. We had nothing to do with anything. And it, it just burns me up. That's why I do a lot of interviews. But um, I try to, you know, support the fellas when I can. And plus, I have a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's very different, because the vibe, last time I was in New York, it was, it was still kind of shaky. You know, we still known as, you know, the rapists, you know. So when I came back, we was like, yo, it's different. We got love out here. The truth is out, come on out. I was like, I don't know, man. I don't think I could deal with it, but, um, you know, Kevin's the same way. He called me, see how I'm doing, because I, I just, you know. Wait, when you say he was doing it, going ahead and con <coughs> taking part in the movie? No, just to, just to, yeah, to come on out, you know, to support, you know, Sarah, Ken, Dave. Yeah. I well, was going to do I would, Ray, Ray, he, you know, come on out. Sarah, I speak to Sarah. Um, like I said before, I didn't trust Sarah. I didn't want to do it, you know, you know, as I spoke to her, you know. I just thought our words were going to get, you know, mixed up. You know, you say one thing, but something else come out. I didn't want to go through that. Mm -hmm. I'm just dealing with it, man, day by day. But, um, like, like, Ray, I want to tell you, man, I got the house and I got the car. You live way better than me, man. Mm. You know? Mm. They're, I, love they're, I love y'all. I just want to say, um, me and my wife, we fight almost every day because I got my kids, and I don't let them go outside. I'm so afraid they're going to get blamed for something they didn't do. Mm. You know, I don't let them ride their bikes around the houses. And me and my wife always get into it. She's like, you know, I got to let them make mistakes. But I know one situation in your life could change your whole life. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to get out of that. I'm taking, away from, I'm taking a lot away from them. But I just don't trust nobody, you know? You know, Somebody. this is uh, PTSD. All five have it. And um, it's, it's so horrible. The, and what's been so amazing is that as, as Sarah and Dave and I were a privileged to be injected into their world, the fact that they do take strength from each other is so extraordinary that Antron is lifted up 
by this as far away as he is, you know, the contacts that he has with Raymond particularly, but also Kevin and all of them. It's, it's just, it, I think Sarah said it, we're just so outraged. This isn't an abstract cost, as you can see. This right. is a real, real cost of people really screwing up and still continuing to believe that they were right, which, which just perpetuates all of this, uh, you know, stuff that these guys have to carry. Kevin, um, <clears throat> this film is, in a way, uh, we, we think it's been it's certainly been out in theaters since last November. It was on PBS last night. It's available online through PBS. Millions of people are going to see this. Many have already seen it. What, what, what has this film meant to you? It changed. It changed our life. We didn't have a voice before. In 89, there was such a media frenzy that we were scared to speak. But now we take the Century Park Five and we wear it as a badge because it gave us this platform now to speak and people see us for who we are. They tried to dehumanize us before. As you can see, we are human. We have kids. We are very well spoken. We have hearts. Youssef, how about you? This film has definitely given us um, an opportunity that, that was stolen from us back in 1989 and 1990, really for most of our lives. You know, the opportunity for us to, to be heard. You know, back in 1989, the only um, depictions that you saw of us or that you heard of us were from courtroom artists and from folks like Donald Trump, folks like um, Koch at the time, you know, um, really everyone. Who, who wanted us, they wanted our heads on stakes, you know. And the, the part that amazes me is that we're constantly in the public's eye now. And as the public gets a chance to travel on this journey of sorts with us, it's like the stories don't match. Just like the false confessions didn't match, the story that we were rapists doesn't match the profiles that you see here before you. Right. You know, and it's unfortunate because people always say to me, what would you guys have been had you not gotten your lives, had you not gotten your lives stolen from you? You know, and we'll never know. I mean, you know, I, I used to always say that you know, we're playing catch up. But I had to check myself one day and said, I don't even know what we're catching up to. Um, we're living life in spite of knowing most of the things that most young people go through. Right. Filling out job applications at a young age, going on their driver's license, new driver's test. You know, we do that stuff now and it's like, wow. You know, I remember filling out a, a you know, writing a resume and it amazed me because I said to myself, you know, both Antron and I, we both had tailor shop jobs, but we couldn't put that. We were, you know, skilled yeah. seamstress, <laughs> you know, for 10 years or for seven years on our resumes. You know, it was a gap, you know, because then you had to basically give phone numbers, so we right. give the number to the jail or something, you know. Right. But this, this has given us such a tremendous, tremendous opportunity 
to, to heal, to get the therapy. You know, they wanted, they actually sent us all the sex therapy in, all, in our various jails that we were in. And most of us got kicked out of sex therapy because part of sex therapy is that you have to admit to the crime. Right. You know. Um, but but this you is guys took us. other classes, right? Yeah. A lot of other classes. And oh, Raymond, absolutely, absolutely. Ra Raymond yeah. mentioned uh, after the, the, the film aired last night, uh, Raymond was keeping track of the social media, like, no, it was coming in like <laughs> hail. It was. <laughs> but there was one that was worth, well, there's many that were worth repeating, but one in particular you mentioned before. What well, was one tweet came in, I, I, I don't remember who, who the person that tweeted, I might have to go back and look, and it basically said, you know, these guys were charged, tried, convicted, and sent to prison, and they got degrees. Mm. What's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> We're, we're going to uh, start taking some questions from members of the audience. And our um, mics are set up. And we've got a couple of, um, couple of interesting ones that have come in um, from <laughs> cyber world, cyberspace. <laughs> uh, Ayana says, some of you started as strangers. Uh, Corey, let me ask you this one. Some of you started as strangers. Are you friends today? Mm. I would like to say overall. I got too much. Oh, God, I just don't know. Mm. Ah. And it now hurts so bad. Going back and forth to court like it's a job. Unfortunately, I found myself expressing myself to an inmate in the day room. Becoming a part of his life as well as he's a part of mine. I can't delete him. Hmm. Never that. 13 years later, half later, so I don't know. He brought himself to me. I died. <clears throat> Little Corey died every day for 13 years or more. I died. Reyes, Mr. Mateus Reyes gave me my life back. Birthdays, Thanksgivings, Christmas. And my mother, wherever you at, I don't get, ah, I'm just thankful to be alive today. As Corey King Wise, I don't know if I'm, a, I'm alive or what. I really don't know. I'm very cold hearted right about now. You're looking pretty alive. You're sounding pretty good, too. But uh, that's, but uh. All right, why don't we hear from uh, some of the audience? Yes. Good evening. Uh, during the time of the investigation, uh, we, the public, were told that uh, once the DNA evidence returned, uh, it would be so convincing that you would, you, they would, the case would just be sealed. It would be no question as to your guilt. Yet when the uh, DNA evidence uh, came back, uh, we, the public, were told that it was inconclusive. I remember Barry Gray, the talk show host, saying it was likened unto uh, several people putting their thumbprint on the same spot, thereby disabling the, the police from getting a, a true reading. So I was wondering, was, was it that the DNA technology which was in his infancy uh, at the time, unable to determine a, a, or get a true reading, or did the police just ignore the evidence? <laughs> no, what happened is the following. There was a very bloody crime scene. There was a victim who 
lost most of her body uh, fluids, and who had been, who, who had on her body both hair and semen. They came from one person and one person only. They got a match between the hair and the semen, or the sperm. And it was the same person. But it wasn't any of these five. It was Matthias Reyes. So what they then said to accommodate this uh, unknown sixth person was that, well, these were not the only people to take part in the attack. There was some others who had yet to be apprehended. And so that was the, the DNA technology did what it was supposed to do. But that other person doesn't show up in any of the confessions. So Despite the fact that they have, the police have his DNA. Reyes was arrested later that same year, and they were able to use his DNA to connect him to other crimes. So, and some of the same detectives are working on these two cases. So there's this opportunity to make that connection. But instead of doing that, they looked at these negative DNA tests, and they figured out how to essentially sweep them on, under the rug, to, to take advantage of the public's lack of knowledge about this, as you said, new form of technology. Um, but it did. It did what it was supposed to do, and it actually excluded these guys and the rest of the kids who were in the park that night. Many of the others, they tested their DNA, trying to figure out who matched it. But there was clearly, and they knew clearly, that there was one sample. It was not some mixture that made it hard to tell. It was not inconclusive. It conclusively excluded them. It was not multiple thumbprints <laughs> on top of the thing. And it's documented also. If you look at a book by a man named Harold Levy, who worked in the DA's office, and he tells you in the chapter on Essential Part 5, there's also a chapter in there on Reyes. But in the chapter Essential Part 5, he tells you when he gets a call from Elizabeth Letterer, she brings him upstairs, and she tells him, I feel, I feel like I've been kicked in the stomach because the DNA doesn't match his any of the five boys. So what do we do? How do we get a conviction? And in that chapter, they tell you how she formulates the plan on how they put this, uh, this whole thing together to, to get us uh, convicted. Yeah. Can we take a question over here? I was wondering from both sides how the process worked in terms of the idea and then approaching, um, approaching the Central Park Five to participate in this project, kind of what the, what the approach was and what the response was, and then also what the status of the civil suit is and kind of how the, how the participants on the prosecuting side have kind of responded. Okay, well, let, let's do the film process question first. Well, I um, began, I had initially written this paper as a, as a, in college um, that was just library research, you know, into the media coverage. But when I started thinking about turning it into a book, um, I knew that I needed to talk to these guys. And so that was the first thing I started um, talking to their lawyers, trying to convince them to let me who am I, uh, to, to have interviews, to be able to talk to them. And um, really the amazing thing, considering what these guys went through being dragged through the mud by the press, um, they really had no reason to trust anyone to try to tell their story. But when I did approach them, they actually all were, I think, sort of ready to tell the story, as hard as that was. And I think appreciated that someone was trying to tell the story, hopefully properly for the first time. And so they agreed right, pretty much right away, but it, it was over years of doing interviews as I worked on the book, I think that we got past a kind of who, what, when, where, um, and into some of the stuff that's harder to talk about. And I think that that's still evolving to this day. Um, but what that meant was that by the time we began working on the film, the book sort of came first, for the most part. By the time we started working on the film, there was a relationship there. And we had, we had begun, we'd been doing these interviews over years and years at that point. And so uh, I think in my, my sense was that for the interviews, the filmed interviews, there was a sense that um, it was time to sort of open up and um, that maybe there was some catharsis in being able to do that. Yeah. Can I add a touch, <laughs> <Just a, laughs> touch on that, what Sarah said. Uh, we had so much bottled up for all these years. So you know, kind of like when you shake a soda yeah. and it does explode, we was ready for that story to come out. But we didn't trust anybody within the media. 
So I was just touching on that because I felt that when I met Sarah a long time ago, mm -hmm. it seems like, and we were just ready. One thing about us that the five of us that you asked earlier was that, you know, how do we view each other? Are we friends? We're not friends. We're brothers. Mm -hmm. And we and when we, when exoneration came out, when came out, we was we became very tight knit. Everybody that came into our circle had to earn their way, mm -hmm. because right. the way that the media did us so horribly back in '89, and and even after, that everybody, lawyers, um, anybody who came, Sarah, and her doing the research and then her telling us the facts was her earning her way. Right. And so when we got to this point of of you know doing the interviews with the book and doing the interviews with the film, you know we can talk to Sarah and she can tell us, she can spit, just like Ken can, they, they, they can tell us the facts word for word. And, and that was what gave us, uh, but, you know, open it up. By the way, Ken, do you happen to know the title of that book? <laughs> it's worth mentioning, the title of the book, Sarah wrote. The, the Central Park Five, A Chronicle of a City Wilding is okay. the original uh, publication, but I think the first, paper was representations of race. No, no, no. We're talking about we're trying to, we're trying to interest Amazon and getting a little over exuberant. Yeah, now it has a secondary subtitle. Right? right, the paperback has a different subtitle, but it's all called the Central Park Five. Okay. I, I want to mention, uh, in reference, one of you, part of your question was about the, the lawsuit. Um, the, the, this uh, forum that you see tonight uh, is not complete. We. Uh, don't have representatives of the police department here, of the city corporation council, uh, or the district attorney's office. Or David McMahon. <laughs> or David McMahon, who's uh, one of the three filmmakers. But um, the, the city and all of its uh, representatives were invited to take part. We would have very much welcomed to hear from uh, the police commissioner, the district attorney, the uh, corporation council. Uh, they declined to participate, um, and as, so as they did win our film. Yeah, over so, and over and over again, we yeah. tried every few months. But let's ask about something. Now that they, they that the film is out, they suddenly seem very interested in it. Ken, would you tell us a little <laughs> yeah. bit about that? <laughs> you know, the so such a frustrating <laughs> process, particularly for Sarah and me, is that we would approach. Um, the interested detectives and, and district attorneys and other officials, and sometimes didn't get the courtesy of a return phone call. Um, and we did this all throughout the production. And in fact, our, this is the most journalistically pure of any film we've made insofar as there's no third person narration. We just have a handful of title cards that just tell you the facts, ma'am. And it's so interesting, as soon as the film came out, they subpoenaed all of our outtakes and notes. Um, a federal magistrate in February um, quashed that subpoena and, and rebuked the city for that, and they've now tried, they've shifted tactics and are uh, appealing that. It's, it's, we're one small frustrating step in this 10-year sort of pulling out of this, but one of the things they said in the subpoena that this was a one-sided advocacy piece. The problem was it's just, you know, it's like some of the, stuff I got at the end when the Civil War came out. There were some people, particularly in the South, who didn't like the way it turned out and blamed the messenger. <laughs> there, are, there, there, are people, there are people in this case who can't stand to this day the truth and want to blame the process of the messengers in this case. Right. And they are completely still wedded to these alternative, insane narratives that would figure out that if they can just delay it, you know, these guys are going to just walk away at some point and give up. And they are not going to walk away. We, none of us can walk away from this. Right. Yes, ma'am. Hello, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you. Could you? Uh, Get a little closer there. Is that, is that any better? Talk yeah. louder. Louder? There we okay. go. <laughs> this case happened when I first came to New York. And um, having been born and raised in independent Africa, where integration is a non-issue, I was horrified at the viciousness of the coverage by the press and the name-calling. I didn't know um, as much as I know now about African-American history, but it seemed to be um, going back to the 19th century. Yes. In, I mean, I really felt that they wanted to string you up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
when I saw pictures of you, and you were all such children, it, it really upset me. It really broke my heart, your story. And I saw the film when it first came out. And since then, I've been trying to tell everyone to see it. And um, Thank you. Thank you. Did, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, sorry. I'm just making this all about me, aren't I? <laughs> but I wanted to all let better. you know, first of all, that other people in other countries don't have some of these attitudes. And I'm very sorry you had to go through this. But I wanted to know, have you, have you managed to get good jobs now? Do you have a life, even after all those missing years? I mean, it's still, you know, we, we, we take it day by day. You know, we went through so much. I mean, we have been able to secure jobs, um, but we still walk around with that bullseye on our back. You know, we still walk around with that label. That label isn't going anywhere. And what we did collectively was we came together and we embraced the label. And so um, what we started to do, we started to go out, we started to speak at, to kids in high schools and in colleges. And, um, and that also became part of our therapy. That became part of our, our healing process. Right now, you guys, you don't even know. Like, whew, this is awesome. And, um, yeah. and so um, that's how we started to get back on track, was to invest into the kids, because nobody wanted to invest in us back in 1989. Thank you. Um, I, I just, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end. We got a few more minutes. And I would encourage everybody to uh, keep your questions somewhat pointed. And um, I appreciate that. <laughs> so everybody you. gets a shot. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to the point. But first, I, you know, I do want to <laughs> note that, that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of innocents who are in jail as we speak. And I came along today with uh, Jabbar Collins, who is 16 years, hmm. and Kareem Bellamy, who is hmm. also an exoneree of 14 years. Wow. So here's my qu quick question. Um, you know, if I was on a parole board, I would not give parole to either the New York City Police Department or the District Attorney's Office, which shows absolutely no remorse. Mm -hmm. how, how do you explain that? This is, a, this is a complicated dynamic, which is as old as America itself. It has to do with race. It has to do with class. It has to do with justice. It has to do with just human error. You know, when the Duke white Duke lacrosse players were uh, falsely uh, charged with rape. Uh, that case was fairly quickly, it's, they still went through hell, uh, fairly quickly dismissed. The prosecutor fired, the prosecutor disbarred, and the prosecutor went to jail. Yeah. Same and they were paid millions of dollars. And they were paid they, millions of although dollars. Although I don't believe any of them spent a night in jail either. So we've got a real difference, and there's a real glaring answer, you know, having to do with race. Uh, and class and affordability, but you, you're sitting here with a, that by the way, took place in North Carolina, um, admittedly a sort of haven of education, but um, it's outrageous that this is still going on in New York City. There, there needs to be a period at the end of this run-on sentence that is all about injustice. Thank you. Sir. Good evening, good evening. Uh, my name is V. Bravo. Gentlemen, first, thank you for validating what many of us back in high school, I was 16 and 89, same age as you guys, we knew that it was, it was a hoax. And in the classrooms, in the lunchrooms, we knew that something was up. Thank you to, to Chuck D, who went on Mr. Magic show a couple of, maybe like in 90, and, and, and put the questions in our young minds and, and, and took it back to the days of you know, slavery and made us think. Um, and you know, watching the movie, it, it painted a picture that sort of like, the communities of color went along with the media, but there was, there was many of us who, who, who didn't believe it. And you, being here, you, you're validating what many of us sort of like knew all along. Um, as an educator, I, I wanted to ask you now, in, how do you sort of like transfer your, this story to you know, young men and women of color today um, and, and link it to sort of like their social justice struggles and the Trevor Martins and the things that are happening now? H how, are you, how are we gonna connect wow. your story to their story? I think, um, I think one of the, the, the best things about surviving prison is that had Donald Trump had his way, we would have been only known in history books today. And the fact that we are living parts of history 
the fact that we can be living examples of what injustice means, and in spite of it all, still get out there. Like many of us have been at many of the rallies, Trayvon Martin, for uh, Ramali Graham, you know, um, Kamani Gray. You know, we're out there all the time lending our energies to make that happen, you know. And I think that that right there is where it's at. The fact that they wanted us to die social deaths and what, what this turned out to be was now we have a platform. We've been given a test and we have a testimony and we can give that testimony back out there and we can share and we can also help folks. I mean, there's so many young people who benefit from our stories because when we go back out there and talk to young people and talk to lawyers and talk to future prosecutors and future police officers, you know, they get a sense of what happens when justice is denied? What happens when the system fails you? Right. you know? And this right here, this is the example of um, in spite of it all. You know. We're glad also to have a lot of young folks here in the audience tonight uh, from uh, high schools and all around the city. And, and we thank uh, PBS and the New York Times for making that possible. First time on the mic. Um, <laughs> it's easy once you do the first sentence. Go. <laughs> um, you guys are awesome. Because I lot. couldn't do what you did. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, Don't shoot yourself down so quick. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. Um, my question is, how did other convicts treat you like when they heard your stories and you mm. were in jail? You want what, what was it again? How did other convicts treat them when they... Treat us, yeah. Treat, treat you, sorry. Who want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can take forever. Well, well, you know, it was, it was rough in the beginning because people, you know, they assume that you committed this crime and you have this label of, of a rapist and the only thing that trumps that in prison is a child molester. Yeah. So you consider the bottom of the barrel. And, and, you know, for me, I never, me and Corey never got bailed out. And so we had to grow up very quickly, really fast, at a young age. And, you know, when, 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 when I got shipped to an upstate prison and I was there for five years, you know, people start to recognize your character. And they start to see, like, wait a minute, this isn't a rapist. You know, and then we went on to get GEDs and we went on to get uh, associate degrees and, and we went on to become model prisoners. And then is when a level of respect starts to be implemented, that people start to see that, wait a minute, this. This isn't, you know, everything you read in the paper isn't true because this isn't him, and I'm watching him every day. All but right, we're going to go into a lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> quick questions. Uh, quick question then. Uh, how, and this is for you actually, Jim Dwyer, being a member of the media then and now, and it seems like there's still a lot of sensationalism and just running to uh, come to a verdict on a story. How do you think the media has changed or not changed? <laughs> Uh, I think the question is, has human nature changed? And I do not believe it has changed. Mm. Uh, I think uh, many of us have learned from who've lived through this story. And uh, I know many of my contemporaries are uh, really, really uh, taking a hard look at what they and we, all of us, did in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, it's been a very valuable exercise. I, I don't say that. Uh, inaccuracy and sensationalism are eliminated by any means, though. Can I add one really quick thing to yeah. that? I think what's so interesting is that a good deal of the media that had been so vociferous in, in splashing this all over the tabloids and the nightly news, if it bleeds, it leads, were relatively silent at exoneration, except for those reactionary uh, voices that were permitted over the last decade to really describe the narrative. So in some ways, we're still trying to push off no longer 13 years of injustice, but now 24, this coming Friday, years of injustice as a result of a media that has been essentially passive in this. One of the great exceptions is sitting up w with us tonight in, in, in the person of Jim Dwyer. But for the most part, this is a miserable story about the press. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, you guys said a lot about how you turned down offers to get out of jail just to like preserve your dignity. Um, I was wondering. At such a young age, how were you able to muster up the strength to go on and pursue your, you know, keeping your dignity and keeping your good name? I mean, this was a case where 
we didn't have any choice. You know, we didn't get any breaks. We didn't go to, you know, uh, model prisons, you know, or, or something that's uh, uh, like a medium facility. We went to max jails. We didn't get none of the breaks as far as a work release. Uh, uh, any, uh, you know, we had to leave on conditional release. We didn't make our parole boards. They forced our hand. You know, like Yusuf said, this was not only was it a five to ten and a five to fifteen. This was a death sentence. It was a social death. We was not supposed to survive, and so we had no choice. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I wanted to ask about your legal representation at trial. Did you have to go to trial with public defenders? It seems to me that there were many places where challenges could have been raised. Yes, let's, in your let's Sarah, why don't you quickly yeah. address that? You know, Michael Joseph, who appears in our film, who represented Antron, was actually the only of the defense attorneys who was paid by the court. He was a private attorney, but he was paid by the court. I think he did by far the best job for his client of any of them. Not that I think a fantastic attorney uh, necessarily would have helped. Um, Yusef was represented by Bill Kunstler on his appeal, and Kunstler told Yusef that he didn't think that Jesus Christ himself could have gotten them off. So I think that it was an impossible situation. But the interesting thing is that the other four lawyers were all retained by the families and actually provided less competent representation um, than the Thanks, sir. public Thanks, Sarah. We have defender. one quick, quick. OK. Um. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If a scenario... Oh. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. If a scenario like this happened again in present day, how do you feel the NYPD and the media would act upon it, and what advice would you give to the youth going through it? What advice would I give to who? The youth going through the situation. Ask for a lawyer. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Demand your... Know your Miranda rights. Yeah. Yeah. Ask that the interrogations be filmed from the beginning, not after they've gotten 30 hours of practice out of you. But I think maybe most importantly what you raise there is the fact that this could happen again. I think this is a different city today. It looks different. It feels different than what you saw at the beginning here. But it's really not that different. And things like this happen all the time. This is not an isolated case. This is not something we can look back on and say, oh, it was the 80s. Uh, this is still happening. So I'd, I'd like to, I, we're, we're just about out of time, and I'd just like to say that the importance of a strong adversarial system, good defense lawyers, good judges, good prosecutors, good detectives, a curious and skeptical media are so valuable to our society, and that you are here to uh, talk about this historic, wonderful film, uh, fills me with great hope. And I want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank all of these folks up here who have uh, given us a very good night.